Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Amal Andraus, I'm the Dean of the school and delighted to have all of you here today. This is, event has been in the making for some time now and I'm very excited that it's taken shape in the way that it's taken shape. Uh, a few years ago, actually soon after I became uh, Dean, we, uh, we kind of decided to, to join forces uh, with the new museum uh, and the, the new ink uh, uh, kind of experiments at the time. Uh, to learn from New Ink and launch our own incubator as a way to find, to kind of thicken the transition uh, between inside and outside, between the school and the world out there, uh, extending it just enough uh, to allow people, people to, our graduate and uh, kind of recent uh, uh, alumni to sort of uh, find new ways to engage, to practice, to um, hybridize, to bring things together, uh, to not draw a line between the commercial and the artistic and uh, uh, life and practice and, uh, and, and that's what kind of New Ink members were already doing uh, and it was kind of very interesting to think about the two models um, operating, um, operating together and so this past summer we graduated our third class already, and I think uh, uh, it's been exciting to uh, to see some of them just start up, uh, you know, architectural practices and in the kind of very standard way we think about them. But others, uh, you know, kind of defining new forms of activism, designing apps to think about the city in in new ways, or uh, you know, all sorts of kind of uh, interesting. Um, experiments, all of them with spatial, social, uh, uh, environmental kind of uh, applications or, you know, trying to engage again in, 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 in new ways. And so uh, I think the event uh, is a way to frame a larger context for this notion of incubating uh, practices um, today, creative practices and practices that are engaged and I'm particularly uh, thankful for uh, Karen Wong uh, and David Benjamin for having put their heads together uh, in terms of who we might learn from um, this afternoon. Uh, and so thank you both for all your efforts. Uh, tonight's keynote will be given by Evan Sharp, who uh, is an alumni of the school, um, but also someone who has kind of led led the way uh, in terms of taking uh, design thinking and visualization and uh, in all kind of new directions. Um, but uh, before tonight, I want to welcome David Benjamin, who will uh, share further uh, about the event this afternoon. Welcome, David. Uh, thanks so much. So my name is David Benjamin. I'm director of the GSAP Incubator and also assistant professor here at GSAP. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, welcome our guest speakers to the school from seven diverse labs, incubators, and colonies um, around the world. Uh, so the idea of today is kind of to discuss the current um, excitement and, in a way, explosion of incubator spaces uh, in a broader historical and disciplinary context uh, to compare incubators to labs and colonies to think about innovation uh, from the perspective of both uh, art and industry to consider different cities and different parts of the world and ultimately to see if we might look with a fresh and critical perspective at what each of us is doing and at what we're doing collectively. And um, to start off the event, I'm not going to describe the GSAP incubator at this point. I'm going to speak a little bit later in the event about that more specifically. Um, but I wanted to offer just a pair of my own hypotheses. So these are not speaking necessarily on behalf of the school, just uh, you know, on behalf of me as a, as a person who's been thinking about this kind of space and, and teaching at the school. Um, and the first hypothesis is that um, one of the themes that might bring together these diverse groups, uh, you know, these diverse labs, incubators, and colonies, 
is new ideas. Um, and in a way, I think we could say that all of these labs, incubators, and colonies are about, in some way, creativity and innovation, about giving opportunities to uh, small organizations, early career individuals, um, people with a, a kind of fresh take on things. Um, in some ways, people like taking a risk on a new way of doing things. And of course, there's a long history of these kind of spaces and this kind of thinking, uh, spaces for creativity and innovation. But um, I think uh, this event may be a good occasion to think a little bit about uh, whether there's anything different about this moment than uh, you know, in the history of these kind of spaces and this kind of thinking. Um, in their book called Whiplash, uh, Joy Ito and Jeff Howe uh, uh, describe what they call um, two revolutions at the heart of our current era of accelerating change. The first revolution is technology, and by this they basically mean Moore's law, you know, well-known law about um, exponentially decreasing costs for computation. And the second is communication. And by this, they just basically mean the internet. And what's important to me and, and relevant in this context about that is that they say in the book, when these two re revolutions joined together, an explosive fire was unleashed that changed the very nature of innovation, relocating it from the center, governments and big companies, to the edges, a 23-year-old punk rock musician and circuit board geek living in Osaka, Japan. Um, so I think that's an interesting provocation. We might think about whether we agree with that, whether that's true or not. Um, but I think it, it is worth asking, like, what is our current context? What are, what are our times like and what do spaces uh, for innovation look like now? Um, in addition to that idea about two revolutions, uh, these authors, Ito and Howe, um, describe three conditions that they say define our era. And those are asymmetry, complexity, and uncertainty. And they say, again, you know, this is a quote, and again, they're, they're kind of provocation. The biggest threats to the status quo come from the smallest of places, from startups and rogues, breakaways, and indie labs. So I think that captures something of the spirit of these um, incubator spaces, these new spaces, this idea that um, you know, big ideas might come from small places. And with this in mind, I, I think you know, in some of the discussion today, we might want to think about what is the role of incubators for the individual members in this context, for the supporting organizations and institutions, um, and also for society, you know, what is the role of these um, institutions for society? Um, and of particular interest to us here, you know, in this space at this university at GSAP, um, I think we might want to reflect a little bit about what is the role of incubators for education in the university. And so the second hypothesis, and this is the last thing I'll say before introducing the other speakers, um, is that you know if the first hypothesis is maybe what brings us together about um, you know new ideas and places for new ideas, the second hypothesis is one of the things that might distinguish us or that might be different about these groups is our ways of measuring success. Um, and on the one hand, I think measuring success um, you know can provide clarity, can provide guiding principles in uncertain times, the kind of times that Ito and Howe describe. Uh, it may allow for a shift from um, opinions to more evidence-based uh, discussion and reasoning. But on the other hand, measuring success, um, I think we, we should recognize, is a loaded topic that may be more complex than it first seems. And as a quick example, I want to talk about um, you know, the, the well-known measure of success called gross domestic product, GDP. You know, so I know this may seem like a tangent, but I, I hope you'll uh, see the connection when I get through it. So, you know, GDP, as you all know, is a measurement um, of a country's economic output. And for many years, it's been like a single data point uh, for how a country and its citizens are doing. Uh, and in fact, you know, if you th uh, read about the history of GDP, some people think of it as one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. And I think they, they think that because it had the capacity to create a common understanding, a common ground, 
uh, for what's happening in very complex situations and a way to navigate policies that have you know, real bottom line impact on the lives of people and that in effect can, um, the claim goes, uh, improve the well-being of nations around the world. But I think there are good reasons to be critical of GDP as well as a single measure of success. For example, uh, what about different single measurements? You know, could we replace GDP with something else like some people are already working on, uh, something called the Human Development Index, which adds education and health to economic output as a single measure of success? Um, or a happiness index, and you know, there's been a recent buzz about happiness as something that we should be um, thinking about and even optimizing for. So a happiness index might add to those other terms um, measures of people's social and emotional lives. Um, but also, in addition to just thinking about a single metric, what about multiple measurements? So in addition to just measuring economics, maybe we should be measuring independently things like health, education, environment, inequality, crime, energy, carbon emissions, infrastructure, housing, you know, the list could go on. Um, and maybe we shouldn't just be thinking about combining them into a single score, but thinking of it as a kind of multi-dimensional data set, um, possibly a kind of dashboard rather than a single number to help keep track of complex trade-offs. Um, you know, such as a scenario where you might get a better score for productivity, but you get a worse score for environment. So how do you make that decision? Um, you know, and continuing the, the kind of critique, which is a, a critique with a kind of body of people working on it now, uh, critique of GDP. Um, what if the whole idea of measurement is, is, not, is not the most important point? What if there are qualitative factors of human life that should be considered that are you know, almost antithetical to the idea of quantifying. And I think an interesting example of this um, in, in relation to these critiques is some recent thinking around the circular economy where people are starting to imagine that you might have um, uh, a, a beneficial economy without growth. And that itself is, I think, a, a challenge to uh, GDP as a metric. Um, and finally, bringing this back to uh, our discussion here today and to being at an architecture school and a design school, um, should a system of measurement be considered as more than just a kind of technical decision, more than just an equation, but maybe should a system of measurement be considered an act of design, something that uh, is iterated on, that's critiqued, that's debated, um, that, uh, you know, kind of involves uh, a community, a discussion, and creativity. Um, so it's, it's in, in kind of these ways that I think the example of measuring GDP could be an interesting analogy for measuring success in our incubators. And so I think it could be interesting to hear, you know, from each of our speakers, like, in this kind of intangible world of creativity and innovation, um, how do you measure the success of your projects? How often do you measure it? And do you measure it numerically? Or do you measure it in, in some other way? Um, and and maybe, maybe most importantly, or most broadly, I think it's that uh, in this spirit of kind of questioning and reflection um, that I'd like to kick off the event today. I think this is a, an event and a space for a dialogue, but also some questioning and, and reflection uh, from all of us and certainly uh, from the perspective of the GSAP incubator. Um, so a little bit about the event. We'll have four pairs of speakers uh, this afternoon, um, and we'll have a brief introduction um, to, to each panel, followed by uh, two speakers, and then a kind of conversation between the speakers with the chance for uh, the audience to ask some questions. So our first pair involves two um, well-known institutions that have been working on creativity and innovation for a long time, but uh, possibly from different perspectives. Uh, they both have an incredible legacy. Uh, and I think at the same time are both responding um, kind of proactively to current issues and technologies. Um, so our first speaker will be Marcus Weldon, president of Bell Labs and CTO, CTO of uh, Nokia Experiments in Art and Technology. And our second speaker will be uh, Sh Cheryl Young, uh, executive director of McDowell Colony. So Marcus, please. Thank you. 
hopefully I, I do this right. Um, that was a fantastic introduction. Um, because we actually think about a lot of those things, oddly enough, in, in Bell Labs. But So let me remind you what Bell Labs did. We actually built the transistor that led to Moore's Law and, uh, and then built the internet. Uh, so sorry. Uh, sorry about that. But, uh, but actually, there's, um, it, is, it, it does actually perplex us a bit in a number of ways. Uh, that, uh, because, and we looked at this from a GDP standpoint in that it hasn't produced much value. This is the interesting thing. If you look at economists, uh, look at, and there's this book by Robert Gordon called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And the big dilemma is the first and second industrial revolutions, which were more physical revolutions, physical infrastructure revolutions, trains, cars, planes, roads, etc., produced a massive amount of productivity growth and GDP growth. Uh, and, and pretty much everything since then has been downhill. Now, downhill in an upward way, what I mean by that is everything is growing still, but growing at a less fast rate. And so what the book says is we, we haven't done as well as we did in the first and second industrial revolutions, which are these physical re revolutions. So we built this internet, and it hasn't really done much. And I actually agree with that. Uh, but I'll explain. And, but that, So they're depressed. Most economists are depressed that we're going nowhere good. It'll never be anything good ever again is actually roughly what Robert Gordon says. Uh, he alludes to things that might change this, but he doesn't do it with confidence. Uh, so, so it, it is perplexing to us that we built this thing that should be good. Uh, we invented all these technologies that, should, that actually run the internet, Unix, C, C++, all those things, and, and it hasn't produced any value. So Bell Labs struggles with that because we actually want to do good. So let me talk a little bit about why would an industrial lab want to do good? It seems uh, odd. Uh, well, actually, I would argue to the point about do small things do good and big things not do good, I actually don't think it's right. I think big things, AT&T when it was a monopoly, was actually a fairly noble thing. It, it was the parent of Bell Labs back in the day, uh, and it treated Bell Labs as for the good of mankind. Because it could, because it never had any threat to its uh, economic uh, uh, survivability or its, its profitability. So it could do noble things because the cost was acceptable. Uh, and you could argue that ever since then, the parents have, have actually struggled a bit more to justify its existence because they had less money. Equally, I think a startup on the other end of the spectrum starts with a very noble intent. Normally want to disrupt something for the good of normally humanity, but quickly becomes driven by VC money and what, will, what uh, the VCs demand of it to become profitable according to their statistical metric of success, which is one in 10 of you have to make me a billion dollars, right? So, so I actually think it's not good or, it's not large or small that results in good, it's, it's something but it's actually probably the culture. So what's survived in Bell Labs? So Bell Labs are now 92 years old. You win the age contest, not you personally, but, uh, but uh, McDowell is older, 92 years old, still alive. We have still 1,000 PhDs. What has managed to survive is the culture. Uh, and I don't frankly know why, but uh, we'll, so we'll skip that part because I wish I did uh, and it would make me sound smarter. But I'm gonna explain to you how we exist today and that it's not to do with being a part of a big thing or a small thing. It's a culture that survives, that believes actually doing good is, is, is the right thing to do. And that's a human need thing. So I'm going to talk about human need. So actually, a few years ago, we started reflecting on this problem we've caused by inventing all these things that create the internet. Uh, and then realized that um, you could reduce it to a, a Maslow's hierarchy dilemma. And you all probably know this. It was is quite well known in sort of pop psychology circles. Of, this is what humans want. Uh, fundamentally, you want to get to the top, transcendence, where you can teach others, you have time on your hands, you can teach others, and you can sort of educate the world about uh, uh, better, betterment. And at the bottom are the basic things that you mostly want to spend less time doing. So the hierarchy is you go up to the top, you're satisfied, you're ready to, to, uh, to feel like you're an accomplished human being, and the only way to get to the top, logically, is to spend less time at the bottom. You actually still do the things at the bottom. You have to you know, have safety, security, exactly love and belonging, but you, you spend a sufficiently optimal existence where less time at the bottom, more time at the top. That's what the T's are here. But actually, we started thinking about this. So our goal, if we're doing noble, good things, should be to help people spend less time at the bottom so they have more time to spend at the top. And you could argue that the Internet might have tried to do that. It might have set out on a quest, and certainly the first and second industrial revolutions 
produced mechanical systems that gave mechanical advantage or transport systems that decreased the amount of time taken to do physical tasks, or uh, a physical task is also moving from A to B, uh, giving you more time to do creative things. You could get goods faster, you could get raw materials faster, you could actually do more, more, spend more time producing. The internet probably was trying to do that, uh, trying to actually get information to flow faster so you could do things, but it hasn't achieved it. And I, I think the, uh, the problem fundamentally is because it sort of got off track a bit and started becoming trivialized. And my thesis is because actually we let consumers run the show. People as individuals running the show is probably not a fantastic idea because it's a bit chaotic and disorderly and you end up with apps and social media flames as essentially your metric. I think we need a bit more structure and purpose to that. And the good news is I think it's coming because the big new phase of the internet, and this is what we think about at Bell Labs, is actually automating infrastructure, the physical world, which if you think about it, we haven't really done. Automated media, content, journalism, a bunch of other stuff have been digitized, but not the physical world. And if I can do that, then maybe I can create a new reality where there's something more substantive I do with the internet, and that produces real value. So that's going to be the, the quest we're on. But what we are going to say, and why art and technology, is the right answer, of course, is that I produce something that actually has attributes of all these layers. It saves me time, but it also produces something cognitive and aesthetic. So we started on this quest to say, maybe it's not one or the other. I do this, and someone else does that. Because right, you could argue companies could be down at the bottom here, uh, or they could be at the top. But in fact, the ideal company or product would actually do both, save you time and allow you to spend time on something creative. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. So I, first of all, quotes. I love these. They actually, you can find them anywhere. But they, they, to me, they're absolutely spot on about art and technology. Art challenges technology. Technology inspires the art. Absolutely. Right, it seems trivial to say John Lasseter is a famous uh, animator. Uh, and so he worked on all these sort of uh, CGI animations and, and, and lifelike animations. This one, of course, might be the best, or coming from Steve Jobs. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with humanities, that leads the results that make our hearts sing. I absolutely agree with that. Right? And you could argue the iPhone is a manifestation of that. Its problem is it's stuck being an iPhone, and they don't seem to have a next idea beyond that. But it absolutely is the, is the right way to look at things. This, of course, is a famous one. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Magic also has the sentiments of aesthetic and creative and cognitive, right? It's something that makes your heart sing. And then this one, of course, another famous, a certain high level of technical skills achieved. At that level, science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity, and form the greatest scientists and artists as well. Absolutely agree with that. This is blending. The, 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 the breakthroughs happen when you blend the, the artistic and the technical. So I want to... These are eminent people who have done amazing things, and I, I would agree with this. So, so that's really our quest. The quest of Bell Labs going forward and the experiments in art and technology that we do, uh, is the quest is to find that mix, the mix for the future, not from the past. So how did we get there? I, I mentioned we invented the internet. We actually invented a whole bunch of other things as well, accidentally. Uh, we did uh, stereo sound. We got an a, a Oscar for that. Uh, we, we did the talkies. We actually did uh, voice and... Uh, and sound synchronized for the first time, which was called the Vitaphone. It actually ran all early movie theaters. We started a company that spun that out, and that was the origin of talkies. By the way, the machine looked like this. Uh, we did this, first text to voice, uh, and it did look like that, actually. There was, a, at the time, a secretary who was trained because the, she was the only one capable of actually operating the pedals and the keys that actually took phonemes, which were RF frequency combinations. She would press the pedals and things, and she could make those phonemes into... into into uh, voice, so it was text to voice. She would type and it would speak, uh, and it, it actually exists, and we have one in Bell Labs, and that's roughly, you see the key things, and there's foot pedals, and you tune it up, and there, unfortunately, there was only one person who could ever operate it, so it probably didn't take off. Uh, then, <laughs> then um, we then, of course, did a lot of computer-generated graphics, and this actually is, is gonna be foundational to, to where I'm going, because you know, we did all the early OSs, Unix, C++, etc. But we worked on computer generated graphics to see where that would go. And, and then that led to this thing. And this is important. So we started in 1966 something called Experiments in Art and Technology. Uh, between New York-based artists and we're based in New Jersey now. We were in New York at the time on uh, West Avenue, but now we're in New Jersey. And, and it was uh, the foundational artists were Robert Rauschenberg, John Cage, or, uh, Robert Whitman and Andy Warhol, and, there were, and then the, the experiment was the following. Analog art was meeting digital technology, so they did these wacky experiments. They, uh, you can see the videos on YouTube if you've never watched them, they're wacky. One of them is a 
tennis ball that every time you hit it sounded a gong, and that was, that was it. I mean, that's all that happened. So this tennis match they played in the armory just sounds a gong, and they did it by an RF transmitter on the racket that when you hit the ball, they, there was no point to it. It was an experiment to see where digital technologies and art could intersect to do something new. But, so that was nice, it was Vanguard, it was actually amazing things they did uh, in the Vanguard of Art and Technology, and then it sort of did this. It went away for a bit. There actually were EAT communities and chapters, and they existed, but it was so avant-garde that, that not much happened for a while. But then this happened. We woke up and realized 50 years later we, it was time to resurrect it. Um, so we relaunched EAT. It hadn't gone away, but we, we sort of re-energized it, put some money into it. And so we now do that, uh, and we actually fund art and technology experiments, and New uh, Museum and New Inc. is actually one of our favorite partners in this. The quest is what I've explained. The quest is to explore that intersection of art and technology, now not to be in the vanguard, to actually try and solve human, humanistic problems that, that sort of understands how it is we can improve the future of, of human existence. And I'm going to give you some clues about how we might be thinking about that. Uh, so here it is. Oh, by the way, these are our collaborators, a whole bunch of them, that we've done various different things. We've built an antechamber, which is in New Jersey there, which is a whole experimental space of AR, VR, and, uh, and, and, uh, and complete ambisonic sound environment. Those are the speakers you can see there. So we've got a whole bunch of spaces. These are New Ink collaborators with Sogwen and Lisa Park and Hammerstep. They came from New Ink. That they are art and technology experiments, and I'm happy to talk about each one. And this is a beatboxer called Reaps One. Uh, all of them are doing different experiments in art and technology. But here's what I want to explain the journey we're on. So if you think about where we come from, the internet that hasn't helped us, uh, we've been on a Star Trek journey, but we haven't completed the journey. So I like to always use science fiction as a bit of a way to think about the future, because often the best science fiction tells you, because it resonated, why did you like Star Trek? You didn't like Star Trek because of William Shatner. You liked Star Trek because it was telling a story that you actually found credible. So the smartphone was the, com was the communicator. The virtual reality that we're ever now is obsessed by is basically the holodeck. And then uh, the replicator, which actually was, they, they represented as just producing food for you, is actually sort of a 3D printer, and 3D printers produce food, as you know. Uh, so, but that was sort of technology-dominated part of Star Trek. And here's the part of where we're going. So the transporter, what was the point of a transporter? It was actually to take you to places where you could, or down, beam you down, so you could actually have a physical world interaction. You could have stayed on the Star, uh, USS Enterprise and watched the world, or you could have teleported to interact. So we think that's important. The tricorder was actually health and vitality, right? It was the one that scanned you, told you whether you were vital or not. Uh, but this is a really interesting one. There was a famous episode called The Empath in Star Trek, where the idea was that uh, the empath, the, the woman there, would actually take uh, and feel what it is you felt and even could abs uh, absorb your negative uh, uh, sort of... Uh, physiological experiences, so she could actually take the burden from you. So I'm going to argue that these three, the journey that we haven't yet completed, are dominated by art and technology, STEAM, obviously science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, uh, and therefore experiments in art and technology enable, because these are much more sentient and cognitive and aesthetic and complete forms of human communications than the ones that we have created so far. So this is my answer to the question of what comes next. We have created technologies that have done something but they haven't done what their ultimate purpose is, which is to do this. So that's what I'm going to stop and hand over to Cheryl, and then we'll chat about stuff. I can't compete with Shatner, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, McDowell, um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to participate in this. Um, and I really enjoy thinking about what the next step is in terms of how we can, um, let's say, improve on the model. And so I'll say a few words about McDowell uh, and about how it came to be and some of the principles it's based on. And then um, a little bit about what we've learned about creativity and uh, sort of the ingredients that you need to make the next steps. Uh, it's, it's really just postulations. It's not scientifically based. Uh, but it's based on observation. And the reason this is important is because whenever you create an incubator uh, or a lab or a colony, the human ingredient is the most important. Uh, this morning when I opened my phone, I read about the evolution of computation and it, its impacts. 
And then I looked at 3D printed lifeguard stations on Miami Beach that were redesigned by architects after the hurricane, when all I really wanted to know was what time I was supposed to be here. Thus, uh, why we need McDowell. The magnificent rabbit hole that is human curiosity occasionally needs to be shut down and focus is on the work at hand. I'll, I'll um, talked a little bit uh, going back in history, so come all the way back to uh, the turn of the century. Uh, the McDowells uh, were artists themselves, and the McDowell model is not the Academy model. Edward McDowell was a composer. He was the founder of the Academy in Rome, which many of um, the architects and designers aspired to go to. Uh, Marion McDowell was a pianist, and she ultimately was the driving force behind the colony because uh, Edward died young. They felt that America could create a new paradigm only if they broke from Europe. And so going to the academy was about learning from the old masters. But from the beginning, McDowell felt that America was ready for, to make its own art, and that their vision for the colony, which was the driving force, um, was that the arts had something to say to each other. Uh, he was a teacher at Columbia, so in some ways Columbia had a part in this because he was kept so busy on the faculty in the music composition department that he didn't have time to make work, new work, new compositions. And he observed that when he was away in the summer, he could um, focus and uh, get his own work done. But the vision wasn't about collaboration as single work as much as it was about taking an idea to the next level through discussion in a non-competitive environment. Not everyone is working on the same problem at a place like McDowell, but they can still help each other spur new ways of looking at an aesthetic problem. Also important to this model is that everyone is a peer. No master apprentice or student system as was the European tradition. Ideas are equal no matter the age or the training. There can be no no when you are trying to break a paradigm. The democratic ideal that no social distinctions should be used to determine who works at the colony was written into the mission 111 years ago. The working man alongside the elite, women alongside men, all aesthetics side by side. It came to fruition as the Peterborough Experiment, and it is the first purpose-built artist residency program, as we know it. So we could look at some slides. I just brought 10 slides, just in case you didn't have a chance to look online at our website, which has um, great photos of the colony. Architecture that is suited to creative work does not necessarily mean having the latest technology. The log cabin. This, in essence, was the first artist residency studio in the country. It was built by Mr. and Miss, uh, Mrs. McDowell so Edward could get away from the house and away from all the distractions and just focus. McDowell gives artists a place in 32 studios on 450 acres in New Hampshire. For two weeks to two months, artists work in solitude and lunch is delivered to their studio. In the evenings, everyone gathers for dinner and come together afterwards to share their work, play pool, and relax. The work is not workshopped. It is respected as it is, as a work in process, and there is no no. There are five design components to the facility that fit the McDowell model. First, privacy in your own studio building. Now, this is the main building. Second, a view to nature and I'll explain why that is important later. Third, a day bed for rest. Fourth, the work uh, space has to suit the task. And fifth, the common space, preferably around food and play. This is an ice house on the um, farm property where it was built that was made into uh, a sculpture studio. And this is the interior. It has a great chain fall where you can work inside or outside. 
This is our new library building. 